Okay, well, hello, um, ACS, SF Bay community, and uh, people calling in or coming in from other states as well. Um, so this is our October uh, fourth Tuesday speaker event. I'm Susan Hopp, board member, and with me is one of our new board members, Wade Cobb. Nice so, to meet everybody. <laughs> So for anyone new to the American Cetacean Society, ACS began in 1967 and is the oldest nonprofit dedicated to the protection of whales, dolphins, porpoises, and their habitat. And we do this through education, community engagement, and awarding grants toward marine research. We do appreciate your donations. Um, they support our mission, they fund our grants, and they support our expenses around these monthly talks. And it's easy to donate on our website if you haven't donated at time of registration. So thank you. And before I introduce tonight's speaker, uh, I did want to alert you that our November talk uh, will diverge from the usual fourth Tuesday due to Thanksgiving week. And will actually be on November 15th, which is three weeks from tonight. And we hope you will join us and hear from our most recent grant awardees three emerging marine mammal scientists will be presenting their research. And then we will take December off for the holidays and we will resume to kick off 2023 on January 24th with the accomplished marine scientist and photographer Galen Rosenwax, whose book, Sperm Whales, Gentle Giants of the Sea has just been published to great acclaim. So those are some coming attractions. But now to tonight's ex exciting talk. Um, we're recording this session and we encourage you to put questions in the Q&A. And after the presentation, we'll do our best to, to get to them. Tonight's talk, listening live for orcas from Washington to California, continues the exploration and discovery of cetacean communication. We're so pleased to have Dr. Scott Veers here from Seattle to share Orca Sound, a project that began as a cooperative effort to listen for the calls, clicks, and whistles of the endangered Southern resident killer whales within the inland marine waters of Washington state. More recently, Orca Sound has been building open source software to make it easier for humans to listen live to the oceans and identify soniferous cetaceans and deleterious noises. The software includes artificial intelligence to help humans detect more whale sounds, including at frequencies above human hearing. Scott is trained as an environmental scientist. He earned his undergraduate from Stanford in Earth Systems in 1992 and he completed his PhD from the University of Washington in 2003 in oceanography. In addition to his research teaching and coordination of the Orca Sound Hydrophone Network and open source project, Scott serves as chair of the Marine Mammal Work Group within the Puget Sound Ecosystem Monitoring Program. Scott, thank you for being here and thank you for your work leading to greater understanding and appreciation of orcas and all cetaceans. Thank you so much, Susan. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for the invitation um, and hello from Seattle. Um, let me share my screen and start um, with an introduction to the, the real authors of this talk. Um, <clears throat> I'm really presenting on behalf of tens, hundreds of people, really. Um, it's been a very interesting experience the last few years, but I, I wanna highlight that we have a hall of fame, which I hope some of you will someday be part of if you're not already. Um, so on our website, orcasound.net, you'll see many folks listed. And um, you'll note that really over the last five years, many of these folks have volunteered with us and um, donated to us, but really mostly volunteered their time and talents to building the software and maintaining the hydrophones that make all of what I'm gonna tell you about tonight possible. Um, so 
that's on my to-do list for this winter is to update this because a whole bunch of new folks came in this this winter, um, sorry, this last year. So with that in place and uh, a quick nod to my father, Al Viers, who sort of catalyzed this whole transition from oceanography to marine acoustics for me um, by retiring to this, the San Juan Islands of, of Washington State where these beautiful whales swim past every summer. Um, let me just tell you that you're invited and you're invited to ask questions anytime tonight. I really prefer that you ask uh, through the Q&A whenever you have a question. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, Susan, please, or Wade, flag, flag me, just interrupt me anytime if you see questions coming in. And I also wanted to- Will do. All right, thank you. Um, I also wanted to invite folks to email me or join our Slack workspace. Um, and if you're interested in any of the, the I'm going to do four little demos in the course of this talk. If you want to follow the links I'm going to follow, if you go to orcasound.net slash talks, you'll see um, this. <clears throat> All the talks I've given recently, and this one right here will lead you to my slide deck. So you, you can have access to and comment on any of these slides from orcasound.net slash talks. So without further ado, let me begin by um, making sure that we all understand the species or the population that um, I hope together we can collaborate to save. Um, the Southern resident killer whales are an ecotype um, or population of killer whale that ranges from Southeast Alaska to Monterey Bay. And we say up here in Seattle, they are our orcas because they're resident in our part of the world during the summertime. Um, in the Salish Sea of the Northeast Pacific, um, killer whales are only intermittently present and they occur probably once a month during the winter months. And the rest of the time, when they're not in the inland water of Washington and British Columbia, they can be found anywhere on the coast of British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, and Northern California. Hey, Scott, sorry to interrupt, but you you are breaking up a little bit. And uh, Wade and I have both noticed it, and I'm not really sure why. Um, it, Let me... Let me um, unshare. No, I just want to make sure I'm sharing the sound. You seeing my screen? Okay. Yeah, seeing your screen, not not in um, in slide slide um, show mode, but if that's okay. yeah. Well, let me let me try. Yeah, maybe that. Let me also minimize this so that there's no video. Screen. Can you see that okay? Yeah, the 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 visual is fine. Um, it it was it's just breaking up and um, not not clear why because I know I've been on others another Zoom with you. Um, but um, I don't know. We'll we'll just see. Why don't we just continue and um, yeah? How about how about this? Let me mute here, and um, if you just give me a minute, I'll go to your email on my phone, and we'll, we can try a quick. I mean, this is an acoustics talk, so let's let's do some troubleshooting. Okay. Mic on. Awesome. Okay, thanks for troubleshooting that with me, Susan. So yeah, I was wanting to make sure that we. So I'm picking up my own feedback through this, this thing. Mic feedback off, mic off. Okay. So yeah, Southern resident killer whales. All right, sorry, I gotta do one more thing. I gotta turn my sound down here. You still hearing me okay through the phone? Yes. Very clear and loud. Great. 
want to do this. Oh. Yes. Great. I do not hear myself echoing. So I will proceed by um, making sure we're all on the same page about the southern resident killer whales. Um, the killer whale part of uh, their name is important for this talk tonight because they are remarkably consistent as salmon specialists. Um, other ecotypes of killer whales specialize on, on other parts of the upper um, trophic levels of the food chain, like eating marine mammals, for example, but these particular southern resident killer whales are apex predators maniacally focused on salmon. Uh, occasionally they'll they'll deign to eat another kind of fish, but have never been observed eating marine mammals like their um, compatriots, the big killer whales or transient killer whales. Um, and it's also important to, you know, since this is the ACS to emphasize that these whales are, are really important in terms of um, the environmental movement and marine conservation in the oceans because they are iconic. They're treasured members of the Northwest and they're in our icons, both modern and historic and tribal. Um, they are charismatic meta megafauna. And if we can't figure out how to save this particular, you know, pandas of the sea, um, it's gonna be a tough, tough challenge for invertebrates or um, rockfish or other ocean species. So we ought to be able to succeed. <clears throat> so um, how can we recede? That's one of the things I wanna to talk about a lot tonight and hopefully get your input on um, as an ACS chapter is, is how can we proceed to recover the Southern resident killer whale population, which is um, not recovering even close to what NOAA specified when it, the species was listed as endangered back in 2005. Um, their growth rate has been extremely slow uh, across all three pods, J, K, and L. And in some pods like L pod, there's been a precipitous decline since the late 1990s. Um, so I think the answer is we need to help them recover in all possible ways. And NOAA has a recovery plan, which identifies the main risks to, uh, that they face. Um, the risks of extinction include foremost scarce salmon across their range, um, persistent pollutants that are in those fish from California up to Alaska, and that accumulate in the, the fats of their blubber over time. Um, and, and then finally, there are vessel effects as well as catastrophic um, risks like disease or oil spills. Um, and the vessel, the vessel effects of, are one of the, the impacts that I've come to specialize in because they involve both physical interference like a boat strike or a disruption in behavior because of proximity of a vessel, but they also include acoustic impacts from both ships and um, smaller vessels, which I will refer to as boats. Both, you know, all vessels that have propellers emit cavitation noise, which is uh, at a wide range of frequencies and is potentially you know, masking their communication signals, their calls, as well as their echolocation clicks that they use for hunting and navigating. <clears throat> so, one of my challenges for the next year is to take the software that I'm going to show you tonight and try to turn it into not just a way to listen to the oceans, but a way to act um, on behalf of the killer whales to solve or mitigate all of those risks at the same time. So it, it's a big complex conservation challenge, um, but I'm an advocate that the technology that we all are experiencing during COVID um, and that is growing so rapidly around us is sure to hold solutions, technological solutions, even for such a complex problem. So I hope we can all be optimistic. Um, any questions that I should answer yet before I go into a bit of history of Orca Sound? I guess I can. 
I I think we're good until um, we get, you know, we get um, further on. Um, if you're looking for a question, there is one from Yvonne. Any chance the marine ferry system can move to electric engines? Would that eliminate the um, the the noise? But if you'd like, Scott, you can, you know, we can save all of these until till the end. Whatever, whatever. No, no. Actually, I really prefer to take them as they come, Susan. So yeah, don't okay. hesitate to interrupt. And this is a perfect segue. Like I have a picture of the ferry right here. So. Um, it's a great question, and we're actually investing in retrofitting these 1960s era ferries um, with new internal propulsion systems. So the engines are getting replaced by electric motors. The fuel tanks, diesel tanks, are getting replaced by batteries. And a huge investment in Washington State is going into the infrastructure you need on shore to recharge those batteries really fast when the ferry comes into the dock for a half hour. Um, so there are big challenges there and, um, and big investments to the tune of $20 million this year, I believe, from Washington State into the Washington State ferries. Um, the problem is that we, it's even more expensive to retrofit the propeller on the outside of the ship that's driven by either a diesel engine or an electric motor. So without re-engineering the ship itself and its propulsion system, it's gonna be hard to get rid of that cavitation noise. And um, so there's an even bigger investment challenge for Washington State to actually replace the full ferries with ones that have been designed from the ground up to minimize the noise impacts. Um, so we're just scratching the surface of what's possible. And your question is a really important one. Um, we have one all electric ferry that I know of in Washington state, which is the Guamas Ferry. Um, but it also was not built to be quiet. It was built to be electric. Um, so it's a, that's, that's a, it's a moving target. We, we don't have thresholds for noise levels that are acceptable in the marine environment like we do for the workers inside the engine rooms of these ferries. Um, so we have some work to do both in terms of setting standards and setting priorities as a society to, to build ships to be quiet rather than to build them to be fuel efficient, for, for example, or greenhouse gas free. So before I go into a first demo, let me just quickly explain what Orca Sound is. Um, it started in the early 2000s, like I mentioned, with uh, a retired physicist throwing a hydrophone into the water or an underwater microphone and being amazed that every summer he heard in beautiful calls coming from nature, these calls, clicks and whistles of, of the Southern resident killer whales. This is his backyard. This, if you can see my cursor, this little orca sound lab aerial photo. It's a rocky shoreline on the west side of San Juan Island. And we started listening there with undergraduates and teaching about the environmental science problems and uh, that uh, I'm telling you about. Um, and then we came into a heyday of, of funding for about five, five years with funding from NOAA. Um, and that allowed us to expand to five locations around the critical habitat of the Southern residents within Washington state. Um, when, that, when that NOAA funding dried up, <clears throat> we had to think about whether we wanted to continue and you know, the ocean has a way of breaking hydrophones and anything else electronic you put into it. So by 2015, we were down to two nodes and scratching our heads about how we were gonna make this work financially. Um, so we kind of, we drew up an, an MOA and we started building a more resilient system with funding coming from lots of different sources um, and volunteers and locations hosted by individual nonprofits around Puget Sound as opposed to all being run through one nonprofit. So what you're seeing here is a map of the three current locations we have in collaboration with the Port Townsend Marine Science Center, uh, Orca Network hosting this Bush Point Hydrophone and our, my company Beamreach hosting uh, with my father, the, this Orca Sound Lab location. This red dot is half online now and is hosted by Orca Conservancy and a summer camp called 
the beach camp for at Sunset Bay. So at Sunset Bay, you'll, you'll see here later, I'm gonna give you a sneak peek um, at our live listening app. And, and it's now part of, not part of the AI that I'm gonna show you, but it is um, coming online. So, so we're, we're in this new era of um, crowdfunding, open source software development, crowdsourcing problems that normally would have done been tackled maybe by graduate students in an academic setting, opening up our data for anybody in the world to use, and building software through these things called hackathons, where actual employees from Amazon and Microsoft will come and help you all day Saturday out of the goodness of their hearts and their interest in conserving whales. Um, and you'll get $10,000 worth of development effort in eight, eight hours from 10 or 15 interested people. Um, so we've been exploring these tools, exploring programs like Google Summer of Code that lets, that actually pays recent graduates um, uh, to work on open source software projects. Um, and we're joining something called a collective, open source collective to take in funds and manage them as a community that's distributed well beyond um, Seattle geographically. Uh, so how are we doing this uh, collaboration? It, as I mentioned, it's, it's happening through hackathons, um, but it's also happening online with community scientists. So many of the folks who listen to it, listen with us um, through the old technology back in the, in the early 2000s are now continuing to listen alongside AI um, using our new open source software. And, uh, and that, that, that method for listening as a human is evolving at the same time the methods for listening as machines are evolving. And ultimately I believe that they'll be brought together so that we as humans and machines can listen together, learn from each other and, and also teach each other. So it's really exciting. Um, on the hardware side, you know, this is what a hydrophone looks like in Val's backyard. The Orca Sound Lab hydrophone has a stand with two of these little hydrophones covered up with pantyhose to keep the currents from making too much noise, like the wind blowing past the microphone. Um, and the signal comes into what used to be a big expensive computer sitting inside a building is now a hundred dollar computer and a hundred dollar soundboard sitting inside a Christmas tree power strip box. Um, so for less than $500, really a $200 now, you can get all the hardware you need to turn a hydrophone signal into an audio signal that plays on any phone um, through your headphones. So that's kind of where we've been in terms of hardware and software. Um, I wanna just pause and give you a demo um, because the more we listen as humans and machines, the more interesting things we hear. And we can turn those interesting things, if we, if we open them up for others to, to, to build with, um, we can build educational resources. And I, I saw that ACSS San Francisco does some nice outreach with guides to whales for students. And I wanted to make sure you understood that all of our recordings from the past five years of streaming live um, are available. And, and so I wanna open up our website again, just jump over to the learn page of our website and show you um, a couple of things that might be of interest as you um, explore new ways of educating students in the Bay Area or in California. Um, so thing I'm most proud of is this listening exhibit that is, you can read about how we built it and you could replicate it. We built it with Orca Network for the Langley Whale Center. Where we, there was an, uh, uh, an old phone booth and uh, looked like this. And we turned it into a, a touch screen inside the phone booth. So you could stand in there with um, other, your family watching on the, a different screen on the outside. And you could play various um, exhibits content. And so this is an example of, I'm going to click on the killer whale here. And so a, a student can come into the booth and touch any of these things on the touch screen and hear this. Fish eating orcas make a wide variety of calls, whistles, and clicks like the southern resident killer whales. The 
those are clicks. So that, and there's more here. There's um, catalogs of common calls, all of the catalog, uh, all the calls that Southern residents are known to make. And there's more coming this fall. A new version of an online catalog for Southern residents, which in 2023 will get um, also transient killer whales and um, uh, even offshore killer whales. So there's there's more coming. I just wanted to flag that, and I'll go back to my talk. Another thing I wanted to flag, since we're going to end by listening to Monterey Bay a little bit, where we're still hearing humpbacks, is this summer um, one of our interns published this humpback catalog. So you can now, when you're listening to Monterey and we're listening to humpbacks up here in Harrow Strait, um, we can all use the same words when we're describing what is this sound. Well, we can say that's a whoop. And this is an ascending moan. And these were the sounds that she thought were most commonly heard in her experience at the north end of Vancouver Island in British Columbia, and then in about um, you know three years of data from our part of Puget Sound. So I'll let you explore that as another tool that could be shared when you're, especially when you're trying to help name sounds um, that you're hearing in a California live feed. <clears throat> so uh, the other thing I wanted to say about um, our software is that right now we are streaming um, with this hardware uh, and the software, when I say software, what I really mean is this is a web application that was built to maximize performance or optimize performance on any combination of an operating system, a device, and a browser. So it's been hard, but we've got this thing working so that you just click on the play button in Chrome or Mozilla, Firefox, Brave, Explorer, um, with Safari on any phone, whether it's Android or iOS, and it should just work. <laughs> so I invite you to try it. Um, and uh, importantly, I'm going to show it to you in a second. But uh, the code that runs on the hardware next to the ocean and the code that runs in your phone on your browser is all open source code. So if you want to change it and make it better, you can. Um, and the tool for doing that is called that we're using is called GitHub. And you are all welcome to join GitHub or invite your tech friends to join GitHub and try to make it better with us. So this is what the live listening app like, looks like live. Um, and like we did before, I could play you examples of the signals we're hoping you'll hear. Calls. Clicks. And really cool whistles. Um, and right now, this is version two of, of our software. And you basically just can choose a location. So there's Sunset Bay. It's only been there for the last week. So let's click on it, see roughly where you are. You can't zoom or anything and see that one person is listening. That's us. It's pretty quiet in the ocean over there. We could listen to that live. We could listen to Harrow Strait live. Something's rustling against the hydrophone. Maybe if we listen to Port Townsend, we'll hear some ships. Now the pizza sound is pretty quiet tonight. There's somebody else listening on this one. Let's just check one more since we're at it. Wow, it's kind of rare. It's three people listening to Bush Point, but it's, it's quiet. Um, this is the entrance to Puget Sound and the ports of Seattle and Tacoma are here. So um, it's unusual to not have a ship going by. But if you listen for an hour or two, I guarantee you're going to hear what a ship sounds like. So let me give you a sneak peek also. Um, you'll notice that when we're listening, um, we can type 
anything. If we, we want to make a comment, we can say, hey, tonight. You can do this for any of the locations. We're not using that yet um, in an automated way, um, but it does show up in uh, a database. So this is a way that humans can tag the auto data in real time. And you can see that folks have been tagging stuff over the last few days at different locations here. So that can get combined, um, I think, in lots of ways. But I wanted to give you a sneak peek of this is what version three of the web app looks like. So now we have uh, a map you're going to be able to zoom in it and out on. And we have our locations on the left, but we can, um, we can close that drawer and the player will be down here. So um, this is going to let us show California if we were to add a site there or anywhere else in the planet. So we are positioning ourselves to be able to scale very cost effectively, but we haven't gone beyond this little part of um, Puget Sound so far. Um, so that was the second demo. Um, you might be wondering, like, where does all this audio data go? And the answer is, um, it goes to Amazon. <laughs> and it, we used to, uh, be operating on cloud credits, uh, but now Amazon has started something called an open data registry and that they are sponsoring us to store this data. So far about four terabytes. Um, and obviously that's gonna increase quite a bit as we add more locations. So the amount of data is going up, but the costs so far have been zero to us, which means it's as long as we can keep that sponsorship going, that this will also scale very economically. And it lets us have, you know, maintain an archive in case you ever wanted to go back and listen to killer whales or humpbacks in, in our recordings. So everything that's streamed live is also recorded. Um, the costs so far have been kept quite low, about $100 per node per month. Um, the other product that's coming out of this beyond the educational products that I mentioned are um, increasing amounts of labeled data. So to train an artificial intelligence, you need to label the data so the machine knows what is a true positive versus a false negative or, or a true negative. Um, so it's taken us a while to do this. So, but since 2019, we've gone through 10 rounds of training and we have about um, 2,500 human labels and um, now it's close to 100 hours of tagged data through the the AI system I'm, I'm about to show you. So the labeled data allows us to develop artificial intelligence to listen alongside the humans. Um, <clears throat> there's been three main projects so far uh, that you could explore through these links. But the one I wanna tell you about is the real-time tool. These other two are tools that were built by through hackathons to label data more efficiently. The Orca Hello project um, is a real-time inference system. So it's a system that listens in real time with the humans and the machine tries to, um, it, it does notify uh, a set of moderators, humans, that whenever it hears a 60 second sample that it thinks is more than 50% likely to be a Southern resident, we get an email um, and the moderator team works together to try to um, answer this question. Was there a, a Killer whale call in the 60 second clip, yes or no. If it's a yes, then a notice goes out to a whole network of folks who are interested in real time detections of Southern residents. Um, if it's a no, we tag it as a false positive and it gets turned into more training data. So this has been really successful since being deployed in 2019. We've, it's helped us identify many, many hours of bouts or, or recordings, and each one of those bouts can be turned into more training data to make the AI smarter. So it's not perfect, um, and it's definitely, I, th I think it's likely that humans will always be in the loop listening along with machines, um, but we are positioning ourselves to use AI to answer some, to, to answer or help solve some really tough problems, the conservation problems I mentioned, as well as the basic biology problems that really motivated us initially um, 
to teach undergraduates about the killer whales acoustics, um, you know, answering questions about marine mammal communication systems, echolocation or biosonar, um, and acoustic ecology are all, you know, new new and challenging fields in oceanography and, and marine biology, um, which I hope we can continue to, to um, contribute to. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention that's been happening up in in um, in Washington that I, I think is happening in California, but I'd be excited to talk about as in our discussion is um, trying to integrate what we hear through these hydrophones with what we see through the sighting networks that predate the whole hydrophone network um, and have grown, grown rapidly and massively in the last few years, thanks in part to COVID and social media. Um, so I wanted to just posit that I think there are great synergies, like the more information we have about who is swimming by our hydrophone at a given location and time, the more we can contextualize what we hear underwater. And at times like night or on foggy days when the sighting network is essentially disabled and not, not um, detecting, the acoustics shines through brightly and can, can detect uh, and help us understand when it, a particular sound making animal is present or not. Um, so with that, I guess I wanted to give you two more um, demos. Um, one is I'd like to show you the, uh, the AI, but I also wanna show you uh, our efforts to aggregate the sightings data in our region with acoustic data. Um, Confused me, so I thought I was going to do the. No, so I did. I accidentally skipped over the demo. So let me do this one first. Uh, this is what the Orca Hello site looks like when you first visit it, and you can see I'm not logged in here. So if you wanted to see what the machine thought was interesting in the last month, you just select that time frame and filter. And I think we moderators fell behind, and we didn't quite process all of these candidates that the machine thought was interesting. So this, for example, was October 16th. And um, if we look at the details, we can see in each of these white, between these white lines, the machine thought it heard a Southern resident killer whale call. So you can see it did very well. It picked up all of these, but it might, looks like it may have missed one here. Pretty faint. But you, you can still hear it. So in that case, I would log in and then mark that as a yes. That was definitely Southern Residents. Um, if you're interested, so, so you can explore the candidates that as they come in in real time along with us. You can also look at the ones that we confirmed recently. If you wanna hear what Southern Residents uh, have sounded like in the last month. You can kind of go through many days of, of recent detections. You can also explore our false positives. And if you go to the dashboard here, um, I think I've preloaded it for you. You can select all time and then see that you know we've had 3,000 false positives, 500 confirmed 60 second events, and you can explore all of them, um, including the tags, if you want to listen to big killer whales, you can, or birds that fooled the AI, lots of birds, um, boats that fooled the AI. Um, you can kind of go through the calls. So there's, this, this is our effort to label data so that you can explore it with your brain or, or machine learning scientists can use it to develop new models. So, um, so that's kind of where we're at in terms of AI. Um, the next steps in AI are to move beyond just, is it a call or not? Um, we'd like to have a click detector so we can detect when, when they're clicking as well as calling. And the combination of those two will be even more certain indication that they're present. Uh, and we have uh, postdocs working on how do you take, if you, if you do, if the first AI tells you it's a call, can you hand it to a second AI and say, which pod was it? do you think, or which call of the 25 calls in the repertoire do you think it was? 
And if we can get to that last one, we, are get, we will definitely be able to start analyzing the communication system much better than we currently can. So I know I'm getting close on time, um, but I wanted to give you one last demo um, just because it connects our states. Uh, so Akarsha is the name of a phytoplankton. And this, this, uh, this is a new tool that we've um, published this year that basically shows you the last seven days of all marine species that have been located by any means um, in this region. And so you can see this, there's not much outside of our region, but we hope there'll be more down here um, through collaborations with folks like, you, like yourselves. Um, so these are examples of mostly sightings. I think these are all sightings that have been put in primarily by Orca Network um, trying to develop this tool with us. So we have a humpback that's still sitting um, in Southern Puget Sound. Uh, we have still a few gray whales lingering up here. And we have, uh, I think this is also a gray whale there and this probably was big killer whales. So you can explore that, um, but most importantly, it's, it's just a view of what data is available recently, like real time data, if you were wanting to ingest it, say to understand how to respond to an oil spill, this is a tool with an API that would allow you to access the, uh, the information, whether it's coming from acoustics or visual sightings in real time. Um, oh, I just wanted to quickly show you, if you look at all of the sightings, um, sort of a measure of the density of sightings in a, in a three month period, you can see that over the past two years, we went from low density to higher density. So the use of this system is growing geographically um, and it also changes seasonally with a lot more sightings during the long summer days up here than in the winter months. Um, the other thing we can do is, so this is pulling in data from a couple of apps in California. One is called Whale Alert. And you can see that there's also been changes in the distribution of sightings in California, um, most notably off of San Francisco, starting to do survey work in addition to letting anybody opportunistically use the, the mobile app. Um, and there's been a lot of activity in Monterey Bay, um, particularly associated with whale watch operators who are using these apps to help um, gain information about presence and absence. So I just wanted to flag that, that, that you know, there are already sightings data in California and we're trying to learn how to blend it with acoustic data up in Washington state. Um, and that like, takes me really to my last couple slides. Like what I hope you can help us with is the challenge in 2023 is trying to bring conservation and the call to action into these web apps. And so we, we have about 3000 subscribers right now and but mostly we just let them know when there's something interesting to listen to and we trust that they will choose to help us label the data um, and we educate them to make them better labelers. But we can also ask them to take action for the, what they're hearing. And so that's, that's really what is front and center in my mind as we think about our open roadmap for 2023. Um, and then we're also thinking about how, to, how do we actually measure that that conservation effect is working. Um, I figured I would segue um, in my last few minutes uh, to the discussion by giving you a quick tour of um, where I, I think we might be in five years. And uh, I hope that by building open tools and sharing our data openly, um, that this way of listening to the oceans and hopefully acting to conserve species that make sound in them um, can spread to other geographies and to other species. Luckily, the ocean is wonderful at, at, at um, selecting for animals that take advantage of how fantastic the modality of sound is in the oceans. And so we have belugas up here in Alaska and in Russia. Uh, we have humpbacks that migrate to Alaska where people have listened. And of course, they've listened in Hawaii. And then there's, um, there's many more places you know, we could talk about potential nodes in 
you know, other oceans. Um, there are other, uh, there's other ecotypes of killer whales in all the oceans. There's been efforts to listen to them in Antarctica even. Um, and there are many folks listening for whales on the East Coast, uh, but not necessarily using the same open source tools, mostly using AI um, buoys and um, gliders. So I'm gonna select, and we can explore this a bit more during the discussion, but you know, we, we have been looking at the satellite imagery of your state and thinking about where we could easily deploy hydrophones. So um, we could talk through this map if you want about how we would do that. But honestly, your, your, your rocky coastal environment is pretty intimidating. So we're gonna need some help and we're a little bit nervous about it. Um, so the last thought I had for you is um, coming back to Southern resident killer whales. Uh, it's really cool that LPOD goes all the way to Monterey Bay in the winter or spring months. And so that's something you should listen for. Uh, especially on the Monterey Bay, uh, Monterey Bay Research Institute's um, hydrophone that John Ryan talked about recently. And mostly you're hearing humpbacks and other baleen whales on that hydrophone, transient killer whales sometimes, but I am super excited to hear some of the residents on it. And there was a good chance to do that in 2019, but I think it didn't quite happen. Um, but I can tell you in a nutshell that the Mars mooring is this yellow yellow marker on this map. LPOD was observed kind of following the contours of the upper canyon in 2019 in March, the end of March. Um, I think they probably went a little bit further east than this based on information from a whale watch operator who was on the water at the time. But they came somewhere between eight and 14 kilometers away from the hydrophone. And John and I have listened pretty carefully and didn't detect them. So either they weren't calling, which is possible, or they were too far away. And so it raises a question for you all to contemplate is, if you're interested in listening for some of the residents on those rare occasions they come all the way to Monterey Bay, is the Monterey Bay, the Mars mooring good enough? Or do you need a hydrophone at, at the Monterey Bay Aquarium and maybe one on the Santa Cruz Wharf? I'll leave you that question and Look forward to, I see there's quite a few Q&As, so maybe we can transition to uh, discussion if you're ready. Hey, thank you, John. I, just to answer you, I think we need more hydrophones. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, it's, it's really cool that you have one already and that you can listen live to it. Um, I didn't quite bring that up, but because it sounds a little fuzzy to me, but um, there is a live feed, and um, you have we have been hearing humpbacks on it recently. So I encourage you to go to this soundscape listening room from Ambari and uh, listen for humpbacks at least. So are there more questions in the Q&A or do you? There are, we had, um, we have about 10, um, which is great. Um, first one, let's see, what's a good one to start with? So Kasson asked, um, on the conservation side, you, you partially answered this, but um, the, the direct question is, in your view, how does research like this intersect with uh, conservation efforts? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so, one, one answer is I believe LPOD is coming down to California because historically there were salmon, large Chinook salmon returning to um, the tributaries of the San Joaquin and Sacramento rivers. And so um, in my dreams, if you were to hear the Southern residents um, in Northern California and then in Monterey Bay. Those folks privileged enough to listen to them live in that rare situation would be thinking hard about where the salmon have gone and what you Californians can do to bring your salmon back, your big salmon back to those big rivers. And I know that's a can of worms and it's a, 
terrifying, complex environmental problem tied up in the history of water rights in California and modern agricultural interests and dams. And we have our own hairy versions of that problem up here. But that's what I think needs to be catalyzed. And it's, it's partially research saying, yes, they do still try to find those fish. But mostly it's, I think the real challenge is like, what actions should you take in California to get more fish available to those whales? Um, and you know, you're, I, I would love to learn a, more about what you've succeeded in doing on the Klamath recently, uh, undamming parts of that river. I know it's, it's been tricky um, in terms of weighing recreational and agricultural interests with the interests of fish and, and the whales that eat them. Um, but there's a success story there, just like there's a success story in our removal of the Elwa Dam up here in Washington. And that success story could be, should be taken to the Columbia River, where we have a shared issue of hydropower that sometimes gets sold to California and sometimes gets used in Washington State, being in conflict with the values that um, could be supported in terms of conservation values for whales if we remove some of our hydroelectric dams. It's a long answer, but it's a really good question. Awesome, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And then there's actually a part two to that question. Um, kind of on a related note, there's uh, there's a lot of tracking of species like certain whales and sharks that are that's happening in the Pacific Ocean. Is there any uh, ethical reason why orcas aren't tagged and tracked in that manner? Yeah, not so much ethical, um, sort of unfortunately biological. Uh, the current satellite tag technology uses a dart to embed um, the tag or at least a, um, a lanyard into the blubber of the whale. And when we do have NOAA, the Northwest Center for um, Northwest uh, Center for Fisheries Science up here in Seattle did have a tagging program for Southern residents. Um, but unfortunately, after a few animals have been tagged successfully and tracked, we have a handful of tracks up and down the West Coast that were starting to give us insights into some of these movement patterns. Um, one of the tag sites got infected and ultimately was attributed through a necropsy to the death of that whale. And so the benefits of tagging have been far outweighed with the apparent risks of tagging these extremely rare Southern residents. Um, so now we're only doing suction, type, suction, suction cup tag deployments, and those are typically only last for less than 24 hours in terms of how long they're on the whale. So a great question. It's just unfortunately too high of a risk to uh, use these relatively invasive tag technologies at the, at the moment. Thank you. Um, all right, next one is from Yvonne. Um, more of a more of a gender question: Are male and female killer whales, or are the male and female calls, different in a predictable way? Uh, like, can you distinguish uh, gender based on the call? Wow, what a great question! That is that is the uh, best question of the night for sure, uh, and I can't answer it. Um, a really wonderful thing about the silent residents is they are very chatty, and so most of their behavioral states they are calling or clicking or whistling. Um, it's a real symphony of sound, unless they're resting, in which case they can be quite silent for a period of an, an hour or three. Um, so that's wonderful that they're so vocal and we should be able to figure out your question. The problem is they also are wonderfully tactile social creatures and they love being close to each other. And so, and like by close, I mean like really close, like a meter or touching, uh, not 10 meters or hundred meters, uh, which would be really nice. If your goal was to try to figure out who said what, you need to localize the sound underwater, like figure out where, did, not just did I hear that call, but where did it come from? And specifically, who did it come from? And since the whales are underwater 90% of the time and um, they're close together, it's actually really challenging to locate them precisely enough to figure out whether it was the mother or the brother or the son that was making the call. And so we only have really one published example of where um, probably a 
a rebellious teenager decided to stray away from her mother. And um, there was a call and response between that young killer whale and either its mother or its brother, because they were close together. And so I can, I can send you a link to that um, call and response in which you could at least tease apart what the calf voice sounded like. But that's our problem is um, we don't have enough money to put enough hydrophones in to localize where they're coming from. And even if we did, they still, you have to be very precise in your localization, um, which is mathematically difficult when the sources are only a meter apart. Makes sense. And uh, on a bit of a related note, uh, can you tell the difference or can anybody tell the difference of what the different calls mean? Like, do you know what whistles are used for hunting or if there are clicks that are used for welcome each other or something like that? Man, you know, y'all have taken me right back to the days of undergraduates and all these great questions come and um, they all hinge on localizing. <laughs> uh, so Maybe the only thing I can offer you is that, you know, sometimes at the surface, they do really obvious things, like they change direction, like the whole pod changes direction, or they breach, they jump out of the water, one of them jumps out of the water. Um, so we've tried to look for correlations between the sounds that happen just before you see one of those obvious surface behaviors, no correlations yet. Um, might be because one group that's but the, another problem with sound in the ocean is that you can hear things that you can't see. So we can hear killer whales when they're 10 kilometers away and you only see them, you know, usually a few kilometers away. So how do you tell whether the sound you just heard came from some animal that's down the coast and wasn't related at all to the surface behavior you just saw? You, you need to localize again. Um, so the, all I can offer you is a really cool study where they looked at all the calls that are made by all the killer whales on the planet, a whole bunch of different ecotypes. And the coolest thing they found was that there was one call that sounded the same, no matter what population you chose. Uh, and they published a cool paper about the excitement call of killer whales, generically. Um, and the Southern residents make this sound, we call it an S10. And that excitement call sounds like a squeaky balloon. <laughs> And I like to think that it's sort of like human laughter. You know, it doesn't matter what language you're speaking, what culture or history you have, we all laugh about the same. Um, so that's the one call Southern Residents make, Southern S10, that I think you could associate with um, a behavior or an emotional state, which is probably laughing. <laughs> that's pretty amazing. Um, a couple of hydrophone questions. Uh, first is, what's the approximate distance that one can pick up? Like how, how far away are the sounds that you're typically hearing at the, at the farthest range? Yeah, well, so it depends on how loud the source is. So if you're a blue whale um, and you're out in the deep, deep Pacific making a very low, very loud sound, um, you can hear that thousands of kilometers away, especially if you go to the, it's called the SOFAR channel, which is a a zone about 600 meters down in the ocean where submarines um, try to get to listen uh, and where the Navy has all of its hydrophones. So if you're in the right part of the ocean and you're listening to a really loud organism like a, a large baleen whale, it can be thousands of kilometers, possibly across an ocean basin. Um, in our part of the world, there are a lot of ships going by and the water is shallow in comparison and there's freshwater layers in the oceanography that change how the sound spreads out. So a bunch of factors mean that the detection range is much lower, typically five to 10 kilometers. On a good day with no ships, we've had a situation where whale watchers were with the Southern residents way down here off of Dungeness Spit, and we heard them up here. So that's about 30 kilometers um, under sort of ideal conditions, but typically, in typical conditions, it's more like five or 10 kilometers. Um, so that's why in Monterey, I'm concerned that the, you know, just the location of the Monterey Bay uh, hydrophone on the Mars mooring is potentially a, a little bit too far offshore for the Southern residents. 
makes sense. Um, and also kind of on the similar topic, but what is the most frequent or what are some of the most frequent false positive sources? Yeah, good question. So it's like 15 miles between the Mars mooring and the aquarium. It's really far offshore compared to everything that we do. Um, oh, sorry, wait, one, one more time, question? No worries, I didn't realize that you were, um, that you were finishing there. Um, but what is the, what's the most frequent or some of the most common uh, false positive sources on the hydrophones? Yeah, um, so our hydrophones are pretty shallow. Uh, the, the shallower we get them, the cheaper they are because hydrophone cable is expensive. And so at low tide, we sometimes, since we're often deploying from a wharf, like, like literally hanging the hydrophone between pilings on, on a wharf, like the Santa Cruz wharf, um, we hear birds through the air-sea interface. And so those, those birds, particularly the pigeon guillemot, they're making sounds, calls, alarm calls in the frequencies that, hum, uh, that orcas also use. And so that, that has been a major source of false positives in the springtime at Bush Point. Um, another common source is one out of about 50 ships sounds really squeaky. Um, and each sheep squeaky ship is a little bit different, but they basically sound like oing, 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 oing. probably have a crab pot line or something wrapped around their shaft, um, or they've thrown a bearing and they make that repetitive tonal sound. And that creates lots and lots of false positives because they take, they're really loud and they take a half hour to go by. So that can create tens or hundreds of false positives. Um, so we're trying really hard to, to figure out what to do when we have that sort of situation with the, with the noisy ship. Um, and then the other one that's really tricky is Biggs killer whales. They, um, humans can quite quickly learn to differentiate between Biggs and Southern residents, but the machines are challenged by it. And so uh, that and humpbacks, those humpback tonal calls are definitely a huge problem as well. Makes sense. Um, another hydrophone related one. And uh, so can, can they be placed in, in some kind of an array to, uh, to determine direction and distance of where the whales are coming from or going? Absolutely, yeah. There, there are um, lots of techniques for localizing in the ocean. The Navy is absolutely expert at this. Um, in the front of a submarine, we'll have hundreds of hydrophones in an array so that you can use techniques like beam forming and matched field analysis uh, to figure out where a sound came from. Um, there's some very basic, basic methods where with just like two hydrophones, you can get a bearing. Um, so there's, and there's, I would say sort of an infinite range. Cool new methods that use the particle motion associated with the sound wave rather than the pressure associated with the sound wave. And you can get directionality from, from that. Um, you can sort of, from the particle motion in, in the water, you can tell which direction the wave came from. Makes sense. Um, okay, so it, here's, here's another, sorry, one more hydrophone one. Um, are there any coordinated efforts to match hydrophone data with visual, with visual behaviors? Um, like uh, apparently the, the, the asker has seen some Facebook groups, but is there any, uh, any real organization behind it? I would say that there's real organization behind those Facebook groups. They have provided incredible and increasingly fantastic uh, context for us. So, um, and I do think they, they are opening the door to answering some of the questions that um, you all have posed, like do males call differently than females? Um, I'm seeing situations here in Puget Sound, the sighting network is so well coordinated and so skilled at getting photographs from shore, uh, that they're getting ID quality photos in real time, often identified in real time on Facebook. Um, so we're really close to being able to say, hey, that, that sound that came through our hydrophone probably did come from that match line. Not just that pod, um, 
we for sure know the pod thanks to the sighting networks, but because of these photos coming in, we are, I think we're really close to being able to say that that matcher line is the one that was obviously closest. And we can tell from even from relative amplitude that the calls that we heard most intensely probably did come from that group. So that's not individuals. And, I'm, and we're going to have to localize to get to individuals. But um, I think it's definitely possible for those sighting networks to take one step further. And I hope we can we can make this happen through groups like the PSAMP the, and the Marine Mammal Work Group is standardized ways that we describe the surface behavior. Uh, it's called an ethogram. If we all share the same ethogram across a Facebook group, we can define like, are they in a resting behavioral state? We can all agree on how to define that. At the same time, we're taking pictures to get down to um, individual IDs. Uh, one thing we've talked about, sort of pie in the sky, but um, adding high resolution cameras to each of our listening locations could open the door to you know, more AI, uh, specifically image analysis of real-time video frames coming in. Um, we're just getting to the point where pan tilt zoom cameras combined with, with still cameras will have a resolution that be able to automatically detect when the dorsal fin is coming up, locate that position on the sea surface and aim a pan tilt camera to get an ID shot. If we can get to that AI assisted or, or, or maybe it's a human, maybe it's a web app where humans are doing this, um, like a remote drone pilot, for example, uh, that will be really helpful. If we, if we had a, if we knew where every individual was as it surfaced and we have some information from our time depth tags about how deep they go and how long they are on a particular trajectory underwater, That'll help us as we start to localize sound. And I think you could tease those two, um, two sources of information, acoustic and surface visual, and finally get at those really burning questions you have about who said what. Makes sense, thank you. Um, couple on kind of the data aggregation side of things. Um, so first of all, you mentioned the submarines and kind of the naval, um, uh, obviously high tech and and lots of instruments. Uh, have they been cooperative as far as sharing data and and um, being involved in efforts or not quite? Um, so, so the the Navy, U.S. Navy has something called the SOSIS network, which is. Uh, a vast network of hydrophones across the globe. And they have shared data with um, geophysical scientists sort of to tr trying to understand earthquakes and general noise in the oceans. Um, so there has been some sharing between the US Navy and the scientific community. Um, biologically, I'm not sure that I know of many examples of that, but I think there's some, um, but definitely not in real time. Right? The Navy is, for the, for example, for the um, one of the thing, one of the sites that we're really excited about, and we had a student working on this summer is um, off of Oregon. Oops, off, off of Oregon. There's uh, Newport, Oregon. There's uh, an existing hydrophone array. So this one is broken at the moment, but these three locations on the continental shelf off of Newport, Oregon, are functional. And those, those actually are technically live streams, um, but the US Navy filters them. So if the if Navy's training in this area, or there's some sensitive sound, they can turn off that hydrophone. But we're excited to improve access to these. Um, we didn't realize that they were live streamed until like a year ago, but we think that particularly this one, when it comes back online, will be quite useful for understanding when the Southern residents are heading your way. Um, and so I guess the answer is mostly they've been, the, the, you know, the navies have been limiting and pretty limited in their collaboration, or especially around real-time data. Um, I think that's probably, I, I, but they have been accommodating in Puget Sound. Like when we met with the oceanographer of the Navy, and we were working to expand the hydrophone network. We consulted with them about where we could listen without, um, impeding national security interests. And they said, basically, you know, they have nuclear submarines coming out of Bangor through Hood Canal and right past our hydrophones, but they were okay with these nearshore hydrophones. They just asked us not to listen in the middle of the channel. 
to avoid recording the signature, the near field or close range signature of their submarine propellers. So, uh, you know, they haven't been super supportive, but they have been accommodating. Uh, there's a training range here where they, they, um, they recorded one of the best recordings of big killer whales ever. Uh, and the Navy did publish that and provide it to Orca Sound to, to share. So you can, I think the stage is set for more collaboration over time, but um, generally they've, they've been pretty wary of the real-time listening uh, capabilities that we've been developing. Awesome, makes sense. Um, and then kind of similar question, but on the other end of the spectrum for the, the normal civilians or the, the, the group of high school people, if they capture a good video or good sound, what would you suggest they do with it? Like where would they upload it? Who would they send it to? Yeah, so I would suggest your like local sighting networks are really worth supporting if, if you have one in your area. Um, you can use apps like Whale Alert if you'd like to share them. Um, with broader scientific communities. Um, the, the area that we're monitoring is um, sort of from Southeast Alaska down to Monterey, but there are other groups using whale alert in Southern California, helping inform ship strike mitigation off of LA and um, in the Santa Barbara Channel. So I guess I recommend, in California especially, I would recommend using whale alert if you'd like to contribute sightings. Um, there's a way to upload a photo as well. Uh, but yes, also supporting whatever local sighting networks might be active in your area is a great thing to do. You can volunteer um, with uh, organizations to like help track the gray whale migration, for example. Uh, I'm sure there's other ideas that you all know of in California that I'm not aware of. Um, and you're also, of course, welcome, even, you know, even though you're in our time zone, you're welcome to listen for killer whales through our hydrophones. Um, up here in Washington. Awesome. And uh, I realize that we're way over time and I don't want to keep you captive for too long, but uh, we have two more if that's all right with you. Oh yeah, um, I was planning to go to 8, 8.30, so. Oh, beautiful, okay. Um, so I uh, so one is from Peter. He asks if there are any studies on low RPM non-cavitating propellers and orcas. Yeah, good question. Uh, so, the answer is yes. There's been a, there's been quite a quite a, a lot of research into the nature of ship noise, and there's the literature is actually quite deep. There's a bunch of it from World War II that's worth some of it's worth looking at. But the gestalt, the overall picture, looking at all of that literature, is generally for most ships and most propulsion systems, slower you go, the quieter you are. So. Um, yeah, every propeller has a cavitation inception point that is a strong function of like how fast it's turning, but also how deep it is, like what is the ambient pressure around it. So uh, it's complicated, but the good news is that it's not rocket science. I mean, for most vessels that we measured in Harrow Strait, um, in a 2016 paper that I co-authored um, in Pure J, the, if you slow down a knot, your broadband noise level or sound pressure level drops by about one decibel. And so a uh, commercial ship, like a container ship, typically cruises at 20 knots, but could go at 15 or maybe even 11 uh, as it's entering the tidally constricted approaches to Vancouver or Seattle. So they could drop their decibel by uh, a lot, it's like maybe nine or 10 dB which is a huge decrease in the amount of radiated power. So that's true also, it's been shown true for whale watch vessels that it's about roughly a decibel decrease per knot. So yeah, if you're a power boater and you, or you, you own a boat, by far the best thing you can do from a noise perspective, if you see a whale is to slow down as much as you can to safely navigate or, or to just power off until they leave. Um, the other thing I guess I would flag is um, the Canadians have something called an underwater listening station. And so they recently have published the largest data set on um, classes of vessels and sort of breaking down how that curve um, changes for different classes of vessels. And so if you're interested, you, I think there's, there's one peer reviewed publication um, that got deeper into the correlation between speed 
which is roughly correlates with the RPM of your propeller and the radiated noise levels for each class of vessel. Got it, thank you. Um, and then one from Bonnie, she said that she sees a video and audio from uh, Orca Labs cameras at Robson Bite. Uh, yeah. Is that kind of what you have in mind and what you want to do here? That's a really good idea. If you haven't seen it, um, we were totally inspired by Orca, Orca Lab. If you just Google Orca Live, you will find their site. Um, they, they partnered with Explore a couple few years ago and are I totally agree with you, Bonnie. They, they have an old technology which still works, which is also worth applauding. Um, so you can listen to them live through this very cool community oriented page um, with this audio thing right here. Click that and then you get a, I think if you make your screen bigger, you get a play button. Yeah, I'm hearing a little bit of water sounds. It sounds like it's quiet in Johnstone Strait tonight, but we're at the north end of Vancouver Island. Um, and obviously at night, there's not gonna be anything, but the these Explore cameras are what Bonnie's talking about. One of them is really cool because it's an underwater camera on the rubbing beach where they, the Northern resident killer whales commonly come and, and for whatever reason, rub themselves on the bottom. Um, so that's, that's actually something I haven't listened to carefully, Bonnie, is like, what sounds are they making when they're rubbing? So th that's, a, that's a student project right there. Um, these are pan, uh, so, so yes, I think these are the sorts of things I was imagining, like, especially if it's a static camera and you can, you can um, start to understand like how many animals are present um, and what's their, like, what's their behavioral state. Even that amount of visual context would be a great addition to what we normally get from the sighting networks. Um, and you know, by putting it on a video, it, it makes it possible to automate it. So uh, yes, that's exactly what I was thinking about. And they, as usual, are pioneering well ahead of Forca Sound. Makes sense. And uh, that's the last one we had in the, in the written Q&A, but I think Susan had one more. I'll pass it back to her. Thanks so much yeah. for reading this, Wade. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, I appreciated um, so much, Scott, how you started with um, how important why we need to save this population of, um, of orcas. And, you know, you mentioned that, I, I guess, getting right to it, I'm, I'm curious what your vision is for how this acoustic knowledge could help, for instance, in one of the greatest threats to our cetaceans, and you mentioned with the, are the ship strikes. Yeah. So in your vision, you know, in your dream, how how would this acoustic knowledge? How could how could that be used to to reduce or eliminate ship strikes as a threat? Yeah, good, great question. Um, and I'm going to zoom back to California for a second because there's, I guess, I have two ways of answering that in a couple minutes. Um, one is, you probably all already know this, but um, off of San Francisco, there's now a buoy, and I don't think I even have it on the map yet. Um, but there's, there's a group at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution that has created um, a buoy, which is sort of designed to, to address your question, Susan. Um, the idea being that you know, this, this started in, off of Boston, that if you hear a North Atlantic right whale up call, you should get the ships to slow down and be more vigilant on their way into Boston or, or out. Um, so that was a group at Cornell that developed that a buoy system there first. Uh, it was supplemented with buoys and gliders by this group at, at Hui and then funded by um, the Benioff Institute and through a partnership with UC Santa Barbara, they put the same technology on a buoy here to inform the slowdown efforts of um, NOAA in Southern California. So uh, there's a whole nother talk here, which and I'm not the right guy to give it, but um, blue skies, I think, in California. 
to find you a really cool website, which is using data from that buoy as well as the sighting networks to um, get ships to slow down to reduce both their physical impacts, the strikes, but also the noise impacts. Um, so I can put you in touch with somebody at the Southwest Fisheries Science Center who could give you a, a proper tour of that system. But that's, that's, so that's one vision is yeah. automated, automated buoys, or, or maybe they're also cabled hydrophones, detecting the presence of a whale and using that to, um, in real time, mitigate the noise or the, the, the lethality of a strike risk. Um, so we certainly hope to do that. And the reason I'm, part of the reason we built this Akarsha thing is so that there would be an API where our, our acoustic detections could be fed to a system that, we're, that the Canadians developed called the Whale Report Alert System in Canada. Um, and that is also was fundamentally meant to reduce the lethality or um, frequency of, of ship strikes. So um, yes, when you push the button on our little app, the idea and the vision is for you, if, if you're sure it was a Southern resonant, that that should go straight to the bridge of any ship that's nearby and help them maintain situational awareness and hopefully reduce the likelihood of a strike. Wow. Um, that, that sounds like, um, that sounds like another topic for, <laughs> for uh, 2023 to continue this fascinating discussion, so. Yeah, and so maybe the segue, I mean, the proper segue to that discussion is get somebody to come and tell you about the Benioff buoy that's now somewhere here. I don't know where it is. It's somewhere off of San Francisco. Okay. Well, Scott, thank you so very much. This has really been fun and uh, appreciate your work so very much. And uh, we'd love to have you come back as uh, all of this, your research continues to take hold and have real impact. And so. Yeah, well, my pleasure. And, and um, you know, I've been part of the Puget Sound chapter up here for a long time, and we used to sponsor Hydrophone. So I'm, I'm hopeful that together across the states, we can sort of take up this challenge, which I think is an interstate challenge of saving salmon for orcas. So um, I know we have a lot of work to do, but I, I think a stronger collaboration between our chapters and um, using tools like Orcasound might be part of the solution. Yes. Well, and let's leave it as to be continued for sure. Great. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Thanks, everyone. Hope to see you in November. <laughs>